Good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to Burge Hill Girls Tomorrow's Women Conference. A particularly special welcome to girls joining us from Burge Hill Academy, Warden Park and Priory, to name just a few of the schools attending tonight. This will be our third annual conference, and when drawing up our programme for the evening, our goal was to ensure we invited a broad range of speakers with a variety of backgrounds and experiences. We were thrilled with the number of positive responses we received and we were very grateful to all the speakers for giving their time and sharing their knowledge and expertise with us. I'm sure this evening will give us an insight into the multitude of opportunities available to the women of tomorrow. As we prepare to take our next steps into our future, I have no doubt that the women you hear from this evening will inspire and encourage you. In the words of Michelle Obama, there is no limit to what we, as women, can accomplish. Finally, our speakers have kindly agreed to take questions at the end of each of their talks. If you would like to, to submit a question, please use the Q&A box on your screen at the time the speaker your question is intended for is talking. Unfortunately, due to time restrictions, we may not be able to answer all of your questions, but we will endeavour to answer as many as we can. I would now like to welcome Emma Tucker, the first female editor of the Sunday Times. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Is that good? Yes. Good. Okay, well, thanks Thanks very much. And uh, hello, everyone. And I'm very pleased to hear that there are some girls from Priory here, because I went to Priory, um, which I'll get onto in a minute. So yeah, I went to, I'm sitting in my office in London Bridge, uh, where the Times and the Sunday Times have their offices. And I'm now and have been for the last 18 months, the editor of the Sunday Times. But it all started not far from where you all are in Sussex, where I went to school at a primary school in Lewis called Wallens, which I was at school with um, Mr. O'Brien Blake's auntie called Helen. And uh, Helen was um, very, very clever and very, very naughty. And she, she used to lead me astray. So it's a good job I'm here today, because if Helen had had her way, I probably wouldn't be. Um, and after Wallens, I went to Priory and I did my, I'm so ancient, um, I did O-levels at Priory, um, back in the day when Priory still had a sixth form. But as it happens, I, and I did a bit of journalism along the way. When I was at Wallens, um, we started a newspaper called Popcorn, which was um, exciting. And I used to write letters to the Sussex Express when I felt moved to do so. And, you know, I did bits and pieces of writing along the way. Um, and then after Priory, I got a scholarship to go to a school in America, which was, I was very lucky to get. So I went over there and instead of doing A-levels, I did the International Baccalaureate. And after that, I took a year off and went to live in Bogota in Colombia. And by the time I'd done all that, I'd um, got a taste for writing. And while I was, on my gap year effectively in South America, I wrote um, a piece about, um, about watching, this was a long time ago, it was about watching the Royal Wedding from South America. And it was a silly little piece and I sent it, I can't remember who published it, but it was the first time I got something published in a national publication. And then after that, I went back, to, I came back to the UK and went to university and I did PP, Politics, Philosophy and Economics at Oxford. And um, while I was there, I had another big breakthrough in journalism, which was sort of handed to me on a plate, really. Um, I was, and it involved a sort of incident at the university where the captain of the rugby team of my college was thrown into my room naked in the middle of the night. Um, and uh, I thought this was not very good. So I decided to complain to the college authorities um, and I went to see the dean of my college and said, I don't think it's on that a naked rugby player should be thrown into my room in the middle of the night. And he said to me, oh, come on, Emma, don't be silly. Um, boys will be boys. You know, they were just having a bit of fun. So I thought, well, I'm not having this. So I wrote an article for The Guardian uh, about this incident. I was, I was, I mean, I changed, I changed the name of the college because I didn't want to get into too much trouble. Although why I thought I was going to get into trouble, that's what it was like back then. And um, the Guardian published it. So that was, again, a, 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 I got a sense of what, what journalism, you know, the power that journalism has, because after that, the college did take it seriously. And, um, the, you know, the incident, rather than being hushed up, was sort of addressed. Anyway, while I was there, I also edited 
the um, college magazine, no, not college magazine, the university magazine, which, believe it or not, was, is, was and is still called ISIS, slightly unfortunate name, but it's named after the river in Oxford. But the point about that, I would say, is that if any of you are interested in journalism, the thing to do is to get involved in any sort of school or college newspaper or um, any, you know, when you, if and when you go to college, get involved with your, you, your student journalism, because it's a really good place to start. Um, anyway, uh, after I, so I did my three years, I did my degree, and then I applied for a graduate trainee scheme um, at the Financial Times, and I was lucky enough to get onto that. So I went to work for the FT where I was trained um, to be a general reporter, um, which involved me, I mean, the Financial Times is a fairly specialist newspaper, but it does do general news, so I would cover local elections, um, I covered the, the poll tax riots, which you're all way too, well, in fact, you weren't even alive when it happened, but they were these big riots in the middle of London over a tax that was very unpopular. Um, I covered um, a sort of financial crisis that happened in 1994, and just generally learned the ropes of reporting. But my big thing was I, I really wanted to go abroad. So um, I kept applying for foreign postings and I wanted somewhere really exotic. So I applied to go and be the Brazil correspondent. Didn't get that. I then, because the FT had a huge network of foreign correspondents. Um, I applied to be uh, the Eastern European correspondent. Didn't get that. I applied to go to West Africa. Didn't get that. And I kept applying for these um, different postings all over the world in very exotic locations. Chicago applied for and eventually the foreign editor called me and he said we've got a posting for you I was like great where Brussels now Brussels is not exactly the sort of war-torn exotic posting that I was looking for but it turned out to be a really really interesting posting because I was there for the when obviously the UK was still a member and it was the creation of the single market and there was lots and lots of things going on and it was a really good fun beat for me and I did it for six years then I moved to Germany to Berlin and did that for three years. Um, and by the time I came back to the UK, I'd accumulated a family and I had three little boys by then. And actually the whole business of covering news became a bit complicated. So I actually moved back to Lewis for a while and um, got a job working as the property editor for the Financial Times. And that didn't require me to travel as much. Then eventually I switched over to features um, and moved back to London and moved to work at the Times where I was features editor. And um, then uh, after I'd done that for about four or five years, I was made deputy editor of the Times. And after I'd done that for seven years, I became editor of the Sunday Times, which is where I am now. And um, I've had a really interesting career. And I would say to anybody who's interested in journalism, it's quite hard to get into journalism. There's no doubt about it. It always has been and it still is. But in some ways, there are more opportunities now than there were even when I was trying to get in. Because although the mainstream media is um, struggling because advertising, all the advertising that used to support newspapers has shifted to Facebook, Google, Amazon and um, the other big tech giants, um, the, there, there are many more outlets for journalism now, mostly in digital. So if you're interested in being a journalist, I would say... Um, write as much as you can. So as I said before, write for your publications, uh, your college publications, maybe ask if you've got local newspapers, whether you can get stints there, work experience, write your own blogs. That's always really good, just, just useful practice. Um, and, you know, just sort of find, find places, outlets for your writing. And um, eventually then when you know, if you decide you want to try and get into journalism, you'll be able to point to stuff that you've done before. And um, it's a really, it's definitely an interesting career. It's not nearly as male dominated as it used to be. You can see that from the fact that I'm sitting here. But um, uh, I think, you know, one, one area where women aren't really well represented is in business journalism and political journalism. Um, and it's good, it would be really good to get more women into those fields because, you know, obviously business and politics affect women just as much as it does men. And um, I, I, I mean, I can't ask you because we, we're not in that kind of forum. But the other thing I'd say is just generally speaking, it's a really, really good idea to read 
a newspaper, by which I don't mean an actual physical newspaper, doesn't have to be that anymore, but read news and journalism on your phone, on your desktop, wherever, because it's just a really good thing to be well informed about the world. And it will stand you in good stead if you're able to uh, comment and talk about what's going on around you. And news is interesting and it's always fun. So um, I don't know whether any of you are interested in journalism, but my advice would be immerse yourselves in it by reading it and also by doing your own writing. Um, so yeah, I don't know whether any of you've got any questions or where I would find them if there are. Um, is there a... I can see a raised hand, but I don't know if that's... Uh, have we got, yes. Hi, so thank you so much for talking. We have a couple of questions for you. Um, our first question that we have from the audience is, uh, should young journalists be focusing more on online news rather than printed news? Well, I would say both. I mean, in a way, they're, 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 there's no difference. What we, we like to say, we're platform neutral. But actually, there's, and, and you know, you can read the Times in its entirety uh, on its smartphone app, uh, on the on the website. So I think the thing to do though is pick a reputable uh, newspaper and read it either in print or in digital. When I say reputable, I mean a newspaper that's got a kind of brand name. So the Times or the Guardian or um, the Telegraph or the Financial Times or the New York Times, because these are trusted sources and uh, they're, 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 it's definitely a good idea to read them because you will come away better informed about the world. And the trouble is there's a lot of rubbish out there on the internet, a lot of rubbish, a lot of fake news, a lot of unverified news, or a lot of news that doesn't put facts and figures in context. It doesn't really uh, give you the full picture. And the thing about newspapers is the journalists who work for them are trained to deliver news that's, that's, that you can trust. So it doesn't really matter where you read it, just read it is what I would say. Um, we also wanted to know, what do you think the most successful moment of your career has been? I think probably getting this job and, you know, it was, I, I, it was absolutely terrifying. And I, I, but definitely, I'll tell you what, when I first went to university, I, my dad had a friend. She was very ambitious, very successful woman, one of the only successful women I really ever came across when I was growing up. And um, she wrote me a letter when I got this job at the Financial Times saying, Dear Emma, congratulations on getting your job. Um, uh, I look forward to you being the first female editor of a national newspaper. And I remember thinking, is she dizzy? You know, I was thinking, there's no way. What is she on about? I just want a nice job. And it didn't really ever occur to me that that would happen. So um, the fact that I did become an editor of a national newspaper not the first of the Sunday Times, they, they did have a female editor back in sort of 1870. And I've got a picture of her on, on my wall, which I'll show you if I could. And she, she's literally wearing a crinoline. Um, and she edited the paper for a year. And uh, then she went off and did something else. But anyway, so yeah, I think becoming editor of the paper was the main moment for me. We also wanted to know, how do you find a way to maintain a work-life balance? Right now, I don't. It's honestly, I did, when the boys, my kids were little, I was really, really ferocious about dividing my time. And I, you know, I, I, I did every permutation going. I did working from home, I did job share, I did part-time work. You know, I tried it all just to get from the point when they were really little to the point where I could basically ignore them, which is now. And um, so I, I managed that, but now it's, it's really difficult because I have to work on Saturdays as well because obviously we're a Sunday newspaper. So I have Sunday off and Monday off. Monday's really annoying because everybody else is at work and they think you're at work. So you're forever getting emails and phone calls and stuff, which is really irritating. But the way I try to keep a work-life balance is, oh, I go to the pub, <laughs> I go running. Um, I watch a lot of television in the evenings and I, I sleep a lot on Sundays. But um, the, the, the job is very full on. It is very full on. And I'm not saying that to be a martyr. You know, I, 
it just is that is the nature of the job it never really stops especially with social media so everything we do gets amplified on social media well that was one of the questions that we had we wanted to know how do you feel social media has reshaped and changed news today it's changed it enormously so in some ways it's been really good because it means if we write an important piece of journalism we can reach new audiences with it so for example uh, when i first started we did a big um investigation into the way the government had handled the pandemic it was very critical and it was a really important piece of journalism in the old days it would have just appeared in the newspaper but as it is we were able to uh send it out on twitter we sent it out on facebook uh we um we had instagram stories around it so we were able you're able to target a lot of different people um, within social media. The, the, the problem with social media is that it, um, it, it's, it's undermined our business model because all the advertising has gone there. And so we're having to find ways of making money. In the old days, it just used to be adverts in, in print newspapers. Nowadays, we, um, we have subscriptions. Um, the other problem is there's a lot of fake news out there that's amplified by social media. And the other problem is that if you say something or write anything that upsets people, I'm sure you're all aware of this, you'll get a kind of social media pile on. And sometimes I, I wake up on a Sunday morning and I, I, I can't face putting my phone on because I don't know what kind of social media pile on will be at the centre of, because there's always somebody out there who's going to not like something you did or take offence or misunderstand something or spot a mistake, you know. So it, it's, it's good because it keeps us on our toes, but it also makes Sundays, Sundays quite stressful. Well, thank you so much for your questions and thank you so much for your answers. It's been really interesting talking to you. Thank Next, you. we would like to introduce Mrs. Ayeni, who is a Nigerian lawyer, fashion designer and founder of the charity Divine Intervention. Hi. Hello. Can you can you see me? Hello. I don't know what to do now. We can see and hear you. All right. Good. Thank you. Um, my name is uh, Abiola Yeni. I am a lawyer by, um, I studied law and um, my intention was to actually practice in the field and um, basically when I got married to my husband, who is also a lawyer, and um, a successful businessman he felt uh, the two of us living home at the same time would affect our children so he thought i should stay home and look after the children and you know me being someone who is a very rest i'm a restless person so i just um, i'm not the kind of person that can sit high do doing nothing all day so I've always had this talent of how of making clothes, making my own clothes since I was a teenager. And I discovered that um, I had talent in designing and tailoring. So through trial and error, you know, I taught myself how to how to make clothes. So when I had no choice, and um, it was a field I could actually go into from home. I decided to um, start something at home. So over the years, <clears throat> I taught myself how to everything, basically everything I know how to do today, I taught myself to do it. You know, I'm a perfectionist. It was true trial and error. When I make mistakes, I was always look when I when I when I make anything, I was always looking for faults. 
in my own work. And it became something that made my work to be very, very outstanding because of that approach to life. You know, I had the opportunity before I got married of working in an embroidery firm where they told me, oh, that was in London, that, oh, you could actually do better. It was basically the way I was working before is um, by freehand. I was doing my um, tailoring by uh, freehand. And basically then they told me, oh, you know, you could actually um, do better with pattern making. So I bought some books in pattern making and taught myself over a period of time and I was able to do more. And um, over, the, over the years, I discovered that um, I had this talent. Oh, let me say, learning from the books made me to discover that when it got to some sizes, that were not on the same one that the example in the book used, the, uh, uh, it wasn't working. So I had to figure out how to solve such problems. And another thing I had to do is I had to also, you know, I discovered that there were a lot of fitting problems that comes from following the books. So having discovered that I had I now started to look for solution by myself outside of the book. So with the help of God, you know, I had to pray that God, you need to just give me the wisdom, the knowledge that I need to actually do, get these things um, right. And in the process of doing that, I discovered that I could, I had special gifts solving fitting problems. You know, people would buy clothes and it's either because they have big stomach or they have the bust, they have no waistline and it just doesn't fit. And when I make clothes for them, I have a way of actually um, hiding the stomach and making it look as if it's flat to the extent that most of my customers will say, oh, how do you do this? Because when I wear other designers, I always have to either wear my gadu or my stomach is showing. But when I wear your clothes, it doesn't need, I don't need to wear gadu. I, I just laugh. It's, it's a gift. So, um, so that was how I developed myself in a profession that I wasn't trained or prepared for. So, um, Another thing that also propelled me after I discovered that I had this gift, I saw the need to find it. I saw, so I looked for what was missing in my chosen field now, which is the, um, the fashion designing. I looked for what was missing and I decided to make it my vision. I discovered that African prints were only available in yardage. You can only buy it in yardage. Nobody was making them into ready to wear that you could actually pick up from the store and you're good to go. So I developed my own sizing and I decided to launch the first ready to wear African prints made in standard UK sizing. And I now got, I got shops in the international airports in Nigeria where travelers into Nigeria can actually pick up something for families and friends. After some years, I also saw the need to introduce the children line because some children want to wear the African print, especially on our Independence Day in Nigeria, it's the rule that all children must be dressed in the African way. So um, I decided to introduce the um, children line in African, African prints. Basically, what inspired me to do that is um, 
you know, when my children were growing up, when we're going to church, my husband would say to them, you cannot follow me to church in jeans. You have to either be in full native attire, which is the African wear, or you have to be in your suit. So, you know, it's easier to wear the native attire. So they became so used to wearing native to church that even when they moved to UK to study, it was their identification mark. They were so used to dressing in that particular manner that, you know, because I just felt that if children are not taught, if you don't groom them to actually like wearing the native, the native attire from when they were young, there's no way you're going to force them to keep the tradition when they grow, when they grow old. So it became part of their dressing and if sometimes it's, it's very amazing in London and my son is wearing the native from Nigeria to travel to UK and I'm wondering what? So at some point I've, um, so these are the things that I had to you know, pass through. And at some point, because I had to, you know, basically I taught myself everything that I'm doing in this field. At some point, <clears throat> I felt that the manual way of making patterns was becoming too dear to me because I'm getting busier than it. So I decided to acquire knowledge in computer aided patterns and went to learn more about how to make my patterns using a software. The major challenge that, that confronted me is that they had, uh, they had templates that were programmed into the, into the software. And I had developed a special way of, of creating fitting around people who lacked, who did not have any shape. So to explain that to that software and get it back became the challenge. So every time I want to convert to start using it, I just feel, oh my God, what am I going to do? So eventually I was able to overcome it because I kept going back and forth. I'll go for the training, come back, not practice it. And then eventually I'll, stop, I will, I'll go back to my manual way of working until I have to also pray that God, you know, you're my source. This is a talent. I don't know anything about it. And then the inspiration came how um, to actually convert my own fitting, how I can explain how my fitting can find expression in that computer and it to be personalized to me. So um, I was able to overcome that. So basically what I discovered is in my years of um, experience is um, you really need to know what you want from life. Because if you do not know what you want from life, life is going to throw anything at you and you may end up spending the rest of your life trying to figure out what you didn't prepare yourself for. Because basically what I went into, even though it's something, it's like, an, it's like an hobby, but it became something that I had to, um, be, I had to um, you know, learn for a period of time. I also had to, you know, forgo my dream to practice because of marriage and children. And I ended up trying to um, figure out what I should actually acquire skill for. So no matter, the talent that you have, I believe my, from my own experience, I would advise never pursue it without seeking additional knowledge in that field, because you will end up spending years figuring out, uh, trying to figure out what you could actually have learned in a straight course. So um, in order, also in order to succeed in a career, you need to research in that field to know the challenges that people who have gone ahead of you are facing so that you will not have to go through making their own mistakes and then 
finding out what they've already found out. So you go straight to the point. So two things you discover when you research before you actually go into a field or a career, because I went into a career that I didn't, I didn't prepare for. So it will either discourage you from pursuing it, meaning that you, are, you don't want you, you, I mean, it's either, it's either um, researching, researching about it either discourages you from pursuing that career or it makes you to discover a solution that people in that field are waiting for. So um, I think um, I'm basically ready for any question now. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much, Ms. Zayani. That was a really Hello? inspirational speech. Um, we have time for one question. Mm -hmm. um, so we've had a question. Do you think having more mm -hmm. women in f fashion power positions would result in more female customers? Would you like me to repeat the question? Um, <clears throat> yes, please. Go ahead. Okay. Do you please think having it. more women in fashion power positions would result in more female customers? Uh, basically, I think so, because when women are the ones that are pioneering that field, they would definitely know the problem that people in that field need to resolve. So it would actually improve, it would increase the, 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 the amount of people in that field, um, the female uh, clientele, yeah. Sure. <clears throat> Perfect. Um, I think that's all we have time for today. But thank you so much again, Mrs. Ioni. That was really inspirational. Thank um, you. Now we will be moving on to Claire Lawrence, uh, a former UK ambassador to Lithuania and who now works in counterterrorism. Um, well, thank you very much and um, good evening, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be able to join you. I think like the other speakers, I'm going to cover sort of 10 minutes of my route to the role and, and what the role was about and then leave a bit of time for, for questions if people have them. So um, I uh, graduated from university in history, of which I remain an extremely strong advocate. I think it prepares you for pretty much anything you can do in life. Um, and I joined the Foreign Office in um, 2000, straight out of university, um, and had had a very varied career. My first posting was in China. Um, so I speak Mandarin uh, Chinese. I get to spend a year in uh, Beijing at university, which was just absolutely fantastic. A really great way to immerse myself in the language and the culture before starting to work there. Um, I then uh, went to West Africa, uh, where I worked in Sierra Leone, not that long after the end of the uh, civil war in Sierra Leone. Um, really, really different, interesting place with a lot of um, challenges around development and uh, and politics and so on. Um, and then I went to Brussels, where I worked at uh, the British Embassy to the EU for three years, negotiating um, in, in, in a committee there um, on conflict and so on, um, and then back to London for a job, um, which was when I then applied to be ambassador in Lithuania, um, which is a sort of strange mixture of um, your normal job application with a, a slightly uh, interesting twist at the end. Um, inside the Foreign Office, we have just a kind of jobs market. So anyone can put their hat in the ring for a job if it's at the, the right grade. Um, and to be honest, I didn't really expect to get it, but I thought I would have a go. Good practice to do the interview. Um, so you go through, you know, you put your application in, you go through the interview panel. Um, the twist that comes at the end then is though that the hiring manager doesn't email you straight away. <laughs> they ask the Foreign Secretary and then the Queen whether you can be appointed, although I don't want to overplay in any sense that the Queen knew who I was um, and that sort of said the yes or the no. Um, but that leads me to kind of the role really, which is that you are um, Her Majesty's ambassadors overseas. So you're representing um, the Queen as head of state um, and then the entirety of the UK um, in the country that you are in. 
So I went out to Lithuania as ambassador in um, 2015. I had never visited the country before. It's wonderful, though. I highly recommend it. Beautiful city, beautiful countryside and very friendly people. Um, but the, the first week that I had um, in my new posting, I think, gives you a flavour of the, the life there, which I'll talk through a little bit in a minute. Um, so I arrived on Saturday evening, uh, got to meet all of my staff on Monday and on Friday went and had an hour with the president. Um, so it's quite quite sort of fast paced job with a lot of interesting uh, things to do. So I spent four years um, in Lithuania as ambassador and um, with a small interruption in the middle um, because I had a baby while I was in the job. Um, I was in fact the second British ambassador to have a baby overseas. Um, so hopefully it's going to happen more and more. Um, but the jobs uh, of ambassador has got sort of two elements to it. So one is internal. You have an embassy of very, very differing sizes. So our embassy in Beijing or Washington, for example, is hundreds of people. And then we have some embassies, um, for example, in some of the smaller nations uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, where you might just have two or three people. Um, we had over 60 in Lithuania, and they came from right across the British government. So I had a defence attaché, for example, who was a serving member of the armed forces. He was or she. I um, uh, had a few of them uh, representing um, the Ministry of Defence and the Armed Forces uh, out in Lithuania. I had staff working on organised crime with the Lithuanians. I had staff from um, the Department of Trade and Investment who were trying to make sure that we were selling plenty of British goods and uh, services to Lithuania and really supporting Lithuanian companies who wanted to come and set up in the uh, UK or invest in the UK. And quite a lot of them did because it really attracted location for lots of reasons, including that many, many, many Lithuanians speak really fluent English. So we had, for example, a lot of financial technology startup firms who wanted to know how to come to London um, to build their bases there. So um, I was representing um, and working with an embassy with uh, more than 60 people from a lot of different backgrounds. Um, many of them uh, from the UK posted in Lithuania, but a lot of them Lithuanian as well. And that's really important because my Lithuanian was never brilliant. And so being able to rely on local staff who could read the newspapers properly and really help me navigate the, um, the country uh, was, was really, really important as well. And of course, when you're the head of any organisation, you're in charge ultimately of things like the, the staff. You know, do you have a motivated staff body who are all really clear on what they're doing, what they're meant to be delivering, um, the buildings, um, the finances, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that's the sort of internal part of the role. Um, and then the bit uh, that I think you kind of see on the television or so on is the external role that you get to fulfil as ambassador overseas, where you spend your entire time representing the UK. So it's actually a very public role quite often, um, trying to make sure that people understand the UK, they understand all of the best things that the UK has to offer. Um, it becomes a really attractive place for people to visit, to invest, and also really importantly, uh, that the UK is... The the key partner of um, Lithuania or the, the country that you're in. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit in a moment about um, what that actually meant um, in terms of two examples. So a lot of my job was about making contacts so that I knew as many Lithuanians as possible. So whenever I needed to get anything done, I would have somebody, um, I would have their contact details and I'd be able to bring them up, uh, um, email them, etc., and and try and get, uh, get business done. You know, if you're trying to help people in coming out to do trade with Lithuania, do I know all of the right people in charge of big businesses to get doors open? Do I know the trade associations, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Um, knowing the government was a really important part of the role. And I used to see a lot of the president, um, for example, um, and I should would know all the ministers, the prime minister, um, and would normally expect again that if you needed to talk to them, you could kind of try and ring up or you'd, you'd get a call within a, a few days so that you could go and lobby them as you needed. Um, uh, journalists. Uh, anybody in any position of influence, think tanks, uh, um, society, etc., anyone in any position of influence, um, then it was it was worth getting to know them so you could try and um, work with them to, to to promote the UK. And then a lot of the job is actually essentially a sales job promoting um, the UK. Um, so as I mentioned, I had quite a public profile. I used social media a lot, and I I did a lot of media appearances. Um, so uh, breakfast news 
news interview, um, radio interviews, newspaper interviews, um, opinion pieces in the newspaper, if I could get them in as well, just to kind of tell the story of what the UK was doing and about its relationship um, with uh, Lithuania. Um, I was really, really lucky that we had a royal visit when I was in Lithuania. And so there was a lot of press around that, for example, and that was fantastic. Um, there's a lot of using soft power. Um, I, one of my highlights in Lithuania was that I got to host a James Bond premiere complete with red carpet and, um, and, and guests in sort of black tie and so on. I, I doubt that's something I'll ever get to repeat in my life, but that was, that was really fantastic. Everybody wanted to come to the James Bond premiere. Um, a lot of hard power as well. So I had um, a few Royal Navy ships out while I was in Lithuania um, and uh, probably thousands of British uh, soldiers um, during the time that I was in there and, and a real opportunity to show case um, what the British kind of hard power and military uh, was all about as well. And then you're using all of that to try and convince the, the government or, or the people that you're working with that they really want to work with the UK, that they want to negotiate with the UK, that they want to trade with the UK, etc. So always trying to build on that sort of set of contacts and the sort of the image that you're promoting of, of, of the UK. And I'll give a couple of examples of, of how that worked in um, practice. Um, so one is that I was in Lithuania during... Um, the uh, centenary anniversary of Lithuanian independence. Um, so that was a really good opportunity to try to showcase how the UK's relationship with Lithuania had always been really close and how they should continue to see us as a really close partner. Um, so we did, for example, um, some museum exhibitions about the history of our relationship. That was why I had a royal visit. Um, we did a campaign where staff in my embassy visited 100 places in Lithuania throughout the year, just to make a bit of a buzz around the the relationship we had. Um, we also, uh, for example, um, supported lots of cultural events during that year. So Lithuania and the other two Baltic states were the countries in focus at the London Book Fair. So I got to do lots of quite fun um, stuff as well around sort of culture and literature and promoting British um, culture in, in Lithuania at the same time. And that, that was really enjoyable. Um, then uh, I was also in Lithuania during the referendum uh, when we decided to leave the EU. So uh, quite a lot of my posting, my, my, my time in Lithuania was spent trying uh, to negotiate with the Lithuanian uh, government here, of course, um, the Lithuanians uh, you know, in the EU. So trying to convince them that uh, they needed to back us up in any conversations that we were having in Brussels, whether it was on trade, whether it was on security, whether it was on uh, citizens living in different places. Um, and I was also in um, Lithuania during the um, Russian attacks in Salisbury, uh, where the Russia attacked to um, assassinate a couple of people and um, Lithuania was a part of the uh, former Soviet Union. They'd also spent a lot of the last few hundred years occupied by the Russian Empire. Um, and so I did a lot of work with, Lithu uh, with Lithuania to try and work out together what was the best way to try and deal with um, the Russia that we were uh, facing uh, today. So really, really interesting and constantly um, varied uh, work. Um, so I think I've had about 10 minutes and I will leave it there, but I'm really happy to take questions if people have them. Thank you so much for that. It was a really interesting speech and we now have quite a few questions for you. Um, firstly, we have quite a few students who would like to know what skills they could be developing now if they are considering a career in diplomacy. That's a really good question. Um, and I'm going to reiterate the advice that you've already heard, actually, which is to read the newspaper. <laughs> um, that, that'll stand you in a lot of um, good stead. I think just kind of knowing what is going on in world politics, both the sort of day to day business, but also what some of the big picture um, trends are and what they, they might mean um, for the UK. That's that's really, really important. And I think we live in such a, a sort of global and networked age that there really isn't a bit of a, a politics or economics or something around the world now that doesn't have an impact on the UK. So I think um, engaging on that is, is really key. Um, and then people who join the Foreign Office tend to do so with a really wide variety of backgrounds. So um, as I mentioned, I have a history degree. Some people do choose to read international relations, but politics, English, English literature is, is really popular as, as well. So I wouldn't worry too much about necessarily what you want to study. I think just something that will give you a really broad base, which 
which allows you to be able to make um, sound judgments quite quickly. I mean, that's quite a key part of the role, being able to analyze information and reach a judgment uh, quite quickly. Um, and then maybe to think about things that will prepare you for that ability to negotiate with people or to engage with uh, with people, because that's another key um, element. And then languages never go amiss. Uh, we really like to post people overseas um, uh, with the ability to speak the local language. And the Foreign Office is very good at teaching you that. So I learned all of my Chinese ready to go to China. I didn't speak a word of Chinese before I joined the Foreign Office. Um, uh, my French is okay, but definitely could be better. But it's so um, a background in languages, you know, Arabic, uh, Russian, uh, Chinese are all good. But you know, any any language is going to be helpful because there is somebody in the Foreign Office who speaks pretty much, I think, now every official language around the world. We have another question asking, have you ever found it difficult supporting UK, UK government action that you don't agree with? Um, that's an excellent uh, question, and I now have to kind of practice all my diplomatic skills to try to answer it. So um, sometimes I think you do get into that position, and you just have to think, I think, you know, I am here to represent. I'm in a representative role. So um, I think knowing why people have made, um, you know, that, that kind of policy choice, I think, is, is really key. And for me, um, being able to think through how I then best presented it. Um, was also really, really important. And actually, that's where having done history and quite a lot of constitutional history was quite helpful during my posting, um, because the foreign minister would come up to me, for example, and ask about kind of proroguing parliaments. And um, I did a lot of um, Stuart history for my degree. So being able to kind of reach back and explain uh, how things had definitely been uh, worse in parliament by quite a long way uh, before now. And this was just part of a kind of normal functioning uh, democracy was really helpful. So I think, yeah, every diplomat will come across Across something I think where they think that is not the policy choice I would have taken but I'm overseas my job is to do what London kind of tells me to do and, and so I will. Um, how would you define success in your career? Oh um, well I think for me I'm um, so uh, for me, it probably was the moment where I knew that I had persuaded the Lithuanians to do what I wanted them to do. Um, so, for example, with the attacks on Salisbury, getting the Lithuanians to agree to some action ahead of any other um, EU nation, which meant it put quite a lot of pressure on the other EU nations. That, 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 that was really good. Um, but I think, yeah, any, any time when you feel like you have managed to persuade somebody else to do something in a way that has left you still the best of friends, I think that was, that, that was the moments of success. Um, how advantageous would you say it is to be bilingual if you were considering applying to the Foreign Office? It is very advantageous. Um, oh, they, the, the Foreign Office likes to, um, as you can tell from my career, send people sort of all over the place. So I know a couple of people that joined with me who spoke Mandarin, neither of them went to China and I did. So it's not a guarantee that if you speak a language fluently, you'll end up somewhere using it. But I think it is really, really useful to, to have another language. And um, I am a very big fan of bilingualism, so much so actually that I made my poor son go to a Lithuanian language nursery in Lithuania rather than an English language one because I thought it was a really good way to kind of expand early his ability to understand at least the concept of a, another foreign language so I yeah I think that that's a really great asset and, and as I was saying learning and understanding a foreign language I think gives you a great advantage in terms of your ability to understand the country because languages are structured differently the grammar the vocabulary all of that tells you a little bit I think about the way in which people are thinking. We have another question asking, do you think Russia is the greatest strategic risk to the UK? Oh, um, so this is the point I think it, uh, which I've done a lot of, um, I've, lost it, I've, I've done a lot of strategic risks to the UK in my career. So my first posting uh, was uh, was in a country that is not always the UK's greatest friend. Um, I've done a bit of Russia and I now work on um, counter-terrorism. So I now do um, non-state based threats to the, uh, the UK. Um, I think the 
I think there is a combination at the moment of strategic threats to the UK, which come from uh, states overseas that don't share our values. And it's not just that they don't share our values, but I think the way in which they're prepared to get their business done also really indicates that they don't share our values. Um, and I think that does pose quite a considerable threat to the UK, um, whether it's it's Russia or some of the other um, big states as well. But I have, to, I have to stand up a bit for counterterrorism now I'm working on it. And, um, and the cyber threat the uh, terrorist threats, the organised crime threats that come from non-state actors, I think, are not going away either. What would you say is the biggest challenge you've had to overcome in your career? Oh, um, I, I would say two, actually. Um, so one was confidence. And when I got to Lithuania, um, one of the great traditions in the Foreign Office, whether you're a, the head of the Foreign Office or whether you're an ambassador, is that outside your office you have a wall of photos of all of your predecessors. Um, and I was the first female to be ambassador in Lithuania, and I was probably a decade younger than all of my predecessors. So there was just a sort of moment of walking into my office for the first time and, and you know, for the first few weeks and months where you just think, I don't look like the other people that have done this job. Um, and I was also quite a lot younger than any of the other ambassadors posted to Lithuania from other countries. And so just getting the, the confidence to feel, you know, no, there had been a really rigorous process. The UK had sent the person that they thought would do a good job out there. And it doesn't matter that I'm not kind of male and 50. Um, that, that was a bit of a, a challenge to get into my head. Um, I have to say, though, that being female um, was an advantage because the president was female and she liked sometimes slightly better to, to sidle up to the women at events uh, or I bumped into her once in the ladies and we had a bit of a chat so it, it, it was an advantage but it took me a little while to kind of get to that um, and then I mentioned that I had a baby during the middle of my posting um, and that was a bit of a challenge uh, as well but again it gave me a bit of a USP compared to all of the other ambassadors and you know you'd be in a line with the foreign minister walking down shaking hands and he'd kind of stop when he got to me and we'd have a chat about how I was feeling and how I was doing and you could see all the other ambassadors kind of going, why is she getting the special treatment? But having the baby was um, was quite a challenge just in terms of juggling it all. So the, the confidence and the work life are probably the two things. Well, thank you so much for speaking to us. It's been really interesting. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, now we would like to move on to Deborah Humphreys, who is the Vice Chancellor of the University of Brighton. Good evening. Uh, I'm just going to try and. Uh, I was going to share my screen. I've got a short PowerPoint. But it says I can't. Hello? Um, is there anybody there who can help? Yeah, I can't seem to share my screen. All oh, right, maybe we can now. Uh, you should be able to share your screen now. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, I hope you can all see that. Um, so I wanted to thank you very much for asking me to come and contribute to your event. Uh, delighted to do so. So I'm Professor Deborah Humphreys. Uh, I'm Vice Chancellor of the University of Brighton, uh, one of the few female Vice Chancellors in the country. And uh, the university is uh, just over two and a half thousand staff, about 19,000 students. And I have not only the lead for the academic mission of the university, but for the university as a business and our budget is just under 200 million pounds a year. So I want to talk particularly about focusing on uh, delivering sustainability. I'm going to take the focus of this to be the focus of the university. So we have four core values, creativity, sustainability, inclusivity and partnership. And as a university, we both create knowledge, we apply knowledge and we put knowledge back to work. Uh, you can't be a university by just educating. We have to inform. We have to research. Uh, so that's what I'm going to focus on quite rapidly on research, on education, on practice and how as a 
leader of the institution, I'm leading this agenda to transform the university. Our curriculum, our educational delivery is now increasingly shaped by the sustainable development goals. If we don't create graduates who have an understanding of the sustainable development goals, have an understanding of sustainability across our planet, and then I think we're not doing them a, a service. Uh, we are all part of this global community and we can all play our role, no matter how large or small, in creating sustainable environment by our actions, by our education, by the choices that we make every single day, um, contributing to a sustainable environment, a sustainable planet. So we embed the sustainable development goals and elements of that both into our education, to our undergraduates and our postgraduates, but also into our research. And our students are just amazing. Our students play an incredible part in our local community and are deeply committed, as I'm sure you are, to a more sustainable life and existence, whether that's working with local gardens, whether that's a food, the food co-op that our students run, whether it's working with disabled and um, disadvantaged students in our local community, um, recycling, upcycling, sustainable approaches to fashion, um, a whole set of ways in which our students get actively involved in issues to help a more sustainable planet. Um, to give you a sense of what we do in terms of our research and our work, uh, we have a whole frame of work around um, a responsible future. Picture here of our waste house. We've got a whole building at the university built out of waste to prove what you can do with waste. Let me give you a taster of what um, uh, we mean by sustainability. So what I tried to illustrate that video quickly illustrates is a whole set of areas of research and therefore areas of work where students are involved as well around sustainability. This is just one facet of our research at the university, whether it's the circular economy, where it's sustainable tourism, uh, sustainable health, air quality. Um, one of our professors has recently um, patented uh, a hydrogen car engine. And you'll have probably heard the work that's going on in uh, Shoreham and around the hydrogen economy. So uh, Professor Penny Atkins, who's another amazing woman, uh, has set out and developed uh, how we can power the economy through hydrogen. And combustion engine, its days are numbered because we'll have a hydrogen combustion. So huge amounts of amazing research in engineering in whole sets of areas across the university around sustainability. We also work with employers. So lots of my colleagues and lots of students get involved in um, with a national center for the green growth platform. So we work with local businesses and uh, entrepreneurs to look at how we can both green their businesses, how we can translate our research into new businesses, but how new businesses can actually become more sustainable, um, whether it's transport, whether it's waste, whether it's power and energy or product. A whole set of um, developments there. Again, green growth platform, really major business innovation. And as an institution ourselves, we use a lot of energy. We create a lot of waste. We have lots of opportunity to generate and become more sustainable to generate energy. So all of our roofs have got um, PV cells on, 
we have aquathermal energy storage. We refurbish our buildings to the highest possible quality, always with energy conservation in mind. Um, we also have a, 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 whole, a person who spends our time doing nothing but working on active travel. So cycle schemes, cycle ways, ways in which we can um, engage with pe moving people out of cars. Uh, we've just built a brand new car park, which I know seems a contradiction, but there are 60 electric charging points in there as we try and encourage people to take up electric, um, electric cars. And everything we do, there's always a focus on waste, on reduce, you know, reduce the amount of waste, recycle. Uh, how can we get the best out of, uh, how can we reduce food waste? How can we think about how we deliver our food and the choices that we make? in order to be able to reduce waste, to recycle um, and to reduce what we use. So um, in terms of being the vice chancellor and a woman leading all of this, uh, I'm really clear that it's every single one of us who has to be involved in changing uh, our planet for the better. We're all involved in this. It's our world. We all get to make those choices and we can make choices in so many ways. Um, so I hope that gives you a sense of um, what I as a female leader am doing to help drive sustainability in our large, in a large organisation like a university. Thank you. Thank you for your speech. That was really interesting. Uh, we've had a few questions as well. So um, one of them is, what is the career path you took to become a vice chancellor? <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, uh, I didn't go to university as an undergraduate. I trained because uh, I'm so millions of years old. I, tra I, I left school and went straight away to train to be a nurse. I became a registered nurse. Um, the NHS educated me, rah rah the NHS. Um, I took on projects, I got infused, um, I ended up working for the Department of Health. I did a master's part-time. I did my PhD part-time while working and commuting. And when you work hard and you, when opportunities come along and you say yes, and you have a go and you prove yourself to be successful and determined, I found myself one day being asked if I'd like to apply for the job of vice chancellor. At the time I was working at Imperial College London um, and I never thought I'd end up working there. So I think you take opportunity, you work hard, it's quite a varied career path to get there. Um, we also have a question. Do you think COVID has had a long term impact on how universities and students interact? I think COVID has had and is having a long term impact on so many things. I think the notion that we will go back to the way it was um, is is false. And I think it would be it would be devastating to lose the learning that we've taken from this uh, situation mindful that we've lost 127,000 of our citizens to this dreadful disease. Um, there is much that we've learned from doing this, going through this, having gone remote, and it's not the way you want to deliver university education, but there are lots of ways in which it has accelerated our embracing digital technology to, I think, to the betterment. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. Um... How would you describe your leadership style and has it changed as your career has progressed? Um, I would be, uh, I'm, I'm authentic. What you see is what you get. Um, I, there are lots of people who try to be terribly clever and try to be terribly sophisticated in their leadership style and I think your personality comes through. You have to be true to yourself um, because every day, my day can vary from uh, has done this week from the incredibly sad news that one of our students has died through to making a very significant estate decision to working out how we're going to um, how we address changes and, and major budget challenges and recruitment for the coming year so I think if you unless you're true to yourself you can't you can't live a deception in terms of your leadership style, because it will come out. The authentic you has to come out. I mean, one of the things I've done across the pandemic is every week through the medium of Teams, um, I've been calling 
individual staff members all across the university, I've spoken to hundreds now every week, have a half an hour with somebody who I've probably never met before just to say, hello, how are you? How's the team? Three simple questions. Um, and it's amazing the impact it's had. People, when they get over the fact the vice chancellor's calling them and it's not to tell them off. Um, I've been really humbled by the conversations that people have had with me and, and the challenges that they face. So I think you just have to be yourself. Yeah, yeah. Um, that kind of links to another question. Um, what is like the typical day of the life uh, being a vice chancellor? <laughs> well, it's not the typical day. <laughs> <laughs> they all change. Um, I, so I'm accountable to the uh, the chair of the board of governors, and uh, my my stocking my stock phrase with the chair of the board of governors as I tell him about something else that's happened is it's never a dull day in higher education. Um, I think it'd be really difficult to say there's a typical day, and literally that has been my week. It's that you know it's from extraordinarily sad and tragic moments to extraordinary, you know, our, our arts graduate show went online this week, just seeing the brilliant work of our students through to, you know, members of staff feeling that they um, have a particular particular view about things, wanting to share that with me, to we've just reported on some work we've done into our Race and Faith Commission. So it, there's, there's no typical day. Um, that's, yeah, we have another question. Um, how do you think being a nurse has impacted your outlook and priorities? Well, it's interesting also because obviously your other speaker, Maria, has um, started and still, I think, practices as a nurse. Um, I, I, I think when I, when I trained as a nurse, uh, you went straight into working in the NHS. And the thing that I learned from that at a very early age in life was all of the traumas, the joys and the highs and the lows of life. You saw a lot of life very early. And I think it, out of that, it shapes a perspective about um, what, what, what's important in life, because you can see a lot of tragedy very quickly and very early. You can see a lot of joy as well. Um, but it's that sense of perspective for me uh, that my, I mean, I, I have, the NHS is just a fabulous organisation to work for. Um, on a completely different note, um, for someone who would like to go into a career in fashion, would Brighton University be a good uni to apply for? Absolutely. Yeah, fashion, uh, fashion and textiles in the School of Art and Media. I, I love our textiles. They're just amazing. Fashion would be a really good course. You can do it in many ways. We're doing a lot of work around sustainable fashion because we can't keep producing denim at the amount of water it takes to do that. We just had, and we have a huge amount of success with our graduates who go on to be very influential in, in, the, in the world of fashion. So please, you know, check out the website, have a look. Have a look on the grad show this year to see the, the ideas that come from fashion, from our fashion students. Thank you. Um, we have another question. How can a sixth former in, assist in enhancing sustainability? It doesn't matter whether you're a sixth former, a first former or a fifth former. Every day you make choices about how you use resources, um, how you, what fashion you buy, um, what you eat, what waste you use. Um, every one of us, every day, the amount of energy, you know, how many times do you get on your bike as opposed to getting in the car? How many times do you walk as opposed to getting in the car? Um, to use public transport. So we all have, we all make choices all the time. Um, and that's, I, every single one of you has a power to shape that. Thank you so much. That was really, really um, in interesting and inspirational. Um, moving on, we would now like to introduce former nurse and now MP for Lewis, Maria Caulfield. Hi everyone, um, it's great to see you all. Thank you so much for inviting me um, this evening. Um, unlike Deborah, I don't have a snazzy video to show you, um, but hopefully I could share some of my thoughts and experiences with you and then take some uh, questions at the end. I know that um, in previous years, you've had um, uh, other MPs uh, along to your evening. I think you had Mims Davis, 
last year, who's your local MP who covers Burgess Hill. And Mims is actually my neighbour. So my constituency is Lewis, um, which obviously covers the town of Lewis, but it also covers three other big towns. So New Haven, Polgate and Seaford. And I do um, have a tiny bit of Burgess Hill in my constituency and a tiny bit of Haywards Heath. And my constituency is around uh, 70,000 constituents, and that's about average for most MPs. So part of my job as an MP is to help those people um, with local issues. So it may be that they're having problems getting housing, they're having problems with maybe benefits, potholes, um, court uh, issues, a whole range of issues, life events that affect people that they come and see their, their local MP about. But um, our biggest uh, part of our role as MPs um, is around making um, laws in the country and making difficult decisions. And I guess um, one of the things I wanted to share with you tonight is, um, you know, how uh, wh whatever career you take in the future, whether you uh, continue in education, whether you um, go straight into the workforce, uh, like myself and Deborah did as, as nurses, or whether you do things like start up your own business, um, some of the most, some of the best decisions uh, in your life that you'll take are often the most difficult and sometimes the most unpopular. So as MPs, we make lots of popular um, promises at election times, and then in between, we have to make um, some really difficult decisions. And the pandemic has been one of those areas. So if you talk to half of my seventy thousand constituents, they will say that we probably didn't lock down early enough at the beginning of the pandemic and you'll talk to the other half who say who query why we're still in lockdown and so making difficult decisions um, around issues like the pandemic it, it can be really really tough and a lot of um, soul searching and sometimes from my short experience of being an MP I was elected in 2015 I found that um, sometimes the most unpopular decisions are sometimes the, the better decisions um, and, and people just you know are often very critical of MPs, but coming to a decision that's neither right nor wrong, it's about weighing up the different balances. It is, is one of the hardest parts of the job, I would say. So things that we have to make decisions on um, are obviously around uh, in the year of the pandemic, around lockdown, around vaccines, who gets them, when do they get them, how do we distribute them, um, difficult decisions around um, travel, overseas travel, local travel. Um, at one point, you know, we were in, um, you know, sh uh, short journeys only. And they're, they're really tricky decisions to make when you're having to weigh up the evidence from a range of, uh, of sources. But also outside the pandemic, uh, we have to make tough decisions as MPs about how we spend public money. And I know Deborah touched on that uh, in terms of um, education. But we um, have a, a, a finite pot of money and we have to decide on whether that goes to schools, whether that goes to the NHS, whether that goes to public transport, whether that goes into investment into um, carbon reduction. And I'm sure all of you, um, you know, have, uh, you know, a small amount of personal money that you often have to make tricky decisions about in your own lives. And there's often not an, an easy way of bringing some extra uh, money in and, and running a country and making uh, financial decisions on behalf of the country is exactly the same. You have to make some tough decisions and um, people often want you to, to have made different decisions to the ones that you have made. Um, we also have to, to decide on um, how we raise that money. Do we increase taxes? Do we um, you know, uh, cap public spending in terms of um, pay, pay increases for public sector workers? Um, do we look at pensions? Do we increase them? Do we freeze them? Or in the day of a life of an MP, they're all the sorts of decisions that we're making on a regular basis. So for me, um, that, that has been the hardest part of, of the job in terms of making those tough choices that are often not popular on the doorstep um, uh, ha has been a real huge learning curve um, since I was elected in 2015. And during that short space of time of six years, we've had obviously a, a global pandemic to deal with in the last year. But we've had issues like Brexit to deal with as well and a, a recession just before that. So, um, you know, uh, certainly I'm hoping in, the, in the, the years to come, hopefully if I'm still an MP, that I'll have some uh, some uh, easier waters uh, to tread 
when it comes to decision making. Because I came into politics um, with no intention of becoming an MP at all. Um, as was said, I was a nurse. I left school. I went straight into nursing, just as Deborah did. Um, I worked at the Royal Sussex County in Brighton. I worked at the Princess Royal in Haywards Heath. And before I was elected, I worked as a nurse at the Royal Marsden Hospital, which is both in Surrey and in London. And I had no intention of ever becoming an MP. Um, I voted, um, but I couldn't have told you at that time who my councillor was. I couldn't have told you who my MP was. Um, and I wasn't particular. I wasn't a member of any political party. And the reason I got involved in politics was because the Princess Royal uh, at that time was under threat of closure. And I knew as a breast care nurse in uh, the hospital in Brighton that if that closed, we were really going to struggle to get our patients in for operations. One of my most hated uh, jobs as a breast care nurse was having to phone women on the morning of their operation to tell them there wasn't a bed that morning because someone in A&E had taken that bed. And I knew if the Princess Royal uh, was closed in Hayward's Heath, that job was just going to get 10 times harder. So I got involved in the campaign by doing street stalls, getting petitions signed, delivering leaflets. And, you know, the campaign was fantastic and, and the Princess Royal is still going today and, and hopefully for many years to come. But that is how I got involved in politics because the local Conservative Party then asked me to stand as a candidate for a local election and I became a councillor um, in Brighton and Hove in a seat I wasn't supposed to win. It was a, 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 a strong seat for one of the opposition parties. And I just kind of got chatting to people, listening to their grumbles, listening to their concerns, um, and just making a few suggestions how I would change things if I was elected. And um, I just worked really hard for that election. And I won that election by one single vote. So um, just to say voting does make a difference. It really can change who represents you um, at, at election time. And the same happened in the general election. I was standing in a seat again that wasn't um, a, a, an easy seat to win. And I just talked to local people, did street stalls, all the things we did for the Princess Royal campaign and again was elected there. So, you know, from from my point of view, um, I guess my second piece of advice, other than, you know, my first bit was about difficult decisions are sometimes um, not easy, not popular, uh, but are often the right thing to do. My second piece of advice is um, that sometimes the path you start off in life isn't always the one you're going to end up on. And don't be worried about a change of circumstances or a, 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 an opportunity that comes um, before you. Grab it with both hands um, and don't be worried if it takes you in a different direction uh, to where you thought you were going to be, because I would never have seen myself as an MP uh, when I was a nurse, um, you know, over 25 years ago. And I guess um, my third bit of advice is do really fight hard for what you believe in and, uh, and the areas you really ca uh, care about. Since becoming an MP, um, one of the areas I'm really passionate about is around um, our environment and protecting um, our local areas. So one of the things I'm most proud uh, of is about um, saving green spaces in the constituency, which is quite topical at the moment with um, house building across the southeast. Uh, but I've worked really hard with local communities to see off some big, large scale developments in places like Newick, which is a, a small village um, not far from Burgess Hill, but also a large scale development of over a thousand houses in Polgate, which would have been the last green space between us and um, Eastbourne. And we managed to see off that development as well. And at the moment, I'm uh, working with local residents and community uh, around a, a, a site that Eaton College has, which is um, set for 3,000 houses, which would, you know, concrete over huge uh, amounts of green fields um, in, in my constituency. And so that's one of the things I'm really proudest of is, is you know, when you're driving past those fields and they're still green and there's, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're not being concreted over, you feel that actually you've made a, a difference there. But some of the other campaigns I've been working on since uh, I was elected, um, firstly, we are set to ban live animal exports um, later this year, and that is something that has taken us years um, to achieve. Um, and I guess when you are trying to make a difference, we are trying to stand up for what you believe in. You know, sometimes those results take a long time to come. So I was elected in 2015, you know, six years later, we're just crossing the finishing line uh, with that piece of work. 
And again, one of the areas I'm really proud of is in Sussex, we are going to be one of the first areas in the country to start a badger vaccination programme against bovine TB. So bovine TB um, is uh, you know, a very cruel disease, which means that cattle have to be uh, slaughtered if they catch TB because it just spreads through herds really quickly. And badgers are responsible for passing that on to cattle. And in some parts of the country, the way they're dealing with that is with um, culling badgers. And as an animal lover, that's something I've, I do struggle with, that you're culling one species to protect another. But in Sussex, we've been chosen um, for a pilot study for badger vaccination to see if we can um, end TB in, in the badger population here and therefore end that transmission um, to, to cattle and herds and, and protect um, farmers um, uh, and so that their, their herds are protected. And that should start later this year. But again, that has been a six year long battle to try and promote that scheme um, a, a, and to um, get the funding and the, the, the green light uh, to make that happen. So that's kind of like a, a whistle stop tour really around um, kind of what my life has been like uh, as an MP, some of the issues that I deal with. Um, but really my three bits of advice to you as potential future leaders uh, of this country in all uh, specialities in all fields is really those three bits of advice is don't worry about taking difficult decisions, even if they're unpopular, if they're the right thing and you feel they're the right thing to do, um, you know, do persist with them. Secondly, um, you know, do fight for, for what you believe in, because you can make a difference, even if it's in a small way everything you do um, uh, will make a, a, a difference overall. And um, thirdly, don't worry about, a, 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 you know, changing your pathway half through in halfway through in life. You know, I had no intention of becoming an MP. It's a huge opportunity and it's enabled me to make a difference both locally and nationally. And you will have those opportunities as well, whether it's it, through edu continuing through education, whether it's setting up your own business, whether it's going into specialities such as law or finance or even politics itself um, you know grab those opportunities when they come and um, don't be afraid of change so that's just uh, a few short messages for me but I'm very happy to take any questions that you have thank you so much for that speech it was really interesting we have quite a few questions coming through Firstly, what have you found is the most significant challenge that you faced in politics? Yeah, so, I, so I've come into a very interesting time in politics. So I was elected in 2015 and we were going through as a country, through um, just coming through the recession. So, you know, I, I've been a nurse on the NHS, experienced um, the, the austerity factor when uh, nurses had a pay freeze and pay cut and the NHS, the finances were really tight. And, you know, I was sometimes there blaming politicians for making some of those decisions. And there I found myself having to, 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 to make some similar decisions myself. So that was very, very difficult. Um, you know, knowing the impact that my decisions in Parliament would have um, on the front line in the health service. The second challenge was Brexit, because whatever your views on uh, whether we remained or, or, or left, it was very divisive. Um, and even now, Parliament hasn't quite settled down. Um, from the effects of that. And I don't think the country has as well. And so I'm hoping that over the next couple of years, um, you know, we can all come together and it, it won't have mattered whether you voted leave or remain, but it was a very difficult time. I remember sitting early hours of the morning in Parliament, going through those difficult votes where Parliament just couldn't decide what to do. And then spending our whole time talking about Brexit when there was equally important issues particularly around my interests around the NHS and education as well. And we just didn't discuss any of those things because Brexit dominated. So I, I found that a real challenge because when I stood for election, Brexit wasn't even on the agenda. And within the first year of me being elected, there it was, and it dominated the next three or four years of my time in Parliament. So I found that extremely frustrating. And I guess being an MP during a global pandemic is, is pretty t uh, tough as well. Um, you know, again, some of the decisions, I'm sure in your own groups, in classes and stuff, if you had a vote on whether you'd extend lockdown, not extend it, who you'd give the vaccine to, you'd all come up with um, different uh, scenarios and very good arguments for each case. 
Um, but that has been a challenge. So they're my top three, dealing with the recession as a country, Brexit and then a pandemic it, uh, have been really big challenges. Next, we had a question asking about what were the transferable skills between working in nursing and then in politics? Yeah, so I guess I'm with uh, Deborah there, um, you know, I encourage you all to go into nursing because it just gives you such a good grounding for, um, for, for life. The, there's huge transferable skills. Um, you know, as a nurse, in your dealing with really difficult situations, you know, I've worked in A&E where people have been involved in accidents and you've had to tell families not expecting um, to lose a, a loved one. Um, you know, some really difficult, shocking news they weren't expecting. Um, you know, that has completely ruined their lives, literally in the space of seconds when you break that news to them. And sometimes they're very angry, they're very upset. You know they're not angry and upset with you, although they, they take it out on you at the time. And I guess that's a bit like being an MP. Sometimes people that I help with in my surgeries, they maybe have lost their home through debt, they may be struggling to get benefits, they may be um, facing um, deportation, because their visas have run out or they didn't apply for a visa in the first time. You know, life-changing events that um, they wouldn't be coming to see me unless they were absolutely desperate. And so it's very similar people skills, dealing with people just in tragic circumstances and just ta not taking that personally because they're just in a desperate situation and a desperate time and just trying to help them as much as you can. Um, and I think for my time in cancer care, where obviously a lot of my patients didn't survive their treatments, is just being able to say to people, you can't make everything better. So, um, you know, I had women with breast cancer who did very well on treatments, but, you know, sometimes, um, you know, did die at the end of that. And we'd have to break that news to them that this treatment wasn't working and that we didn't have any more we could offer them. So being able to be really that brutally honest with people to say, you know, when I've got someone who's on the housing waiting list, been on there for four or five years, they're absolutely in cramped conditions, but I know they're not going to get a new home for another six months to maybe a year. That's not what they want to hear, but from my nursing skills, I'm able to, to tell them that in a way that they can cope with. So nursing um, uh, really does give you that grounding to, in being able to help people in just really difficult circumstances in their lives. And finally, who has inspired you in politics? Um, there's, I mean, there's a, there's a few people that have inspired me. Someone I'm not sure if you will have heard of, but I hope you have, is um, a Labour politician. So obviously I'm a Conservative MP, but it's a Labour politician called Mo Molum. And she was the secretary, and she was a female, she was, I think she was the first female secretary of state for Northern Ireland. Um, if you read about the Good Friday Agreement and the, the Belfast Agreement, which is you know, obviously very topical at the moment with Brexit, you will hear about people like Tony Blair, Bin, uh, Bill Clinton, um, John Hume. You will never hear about Mo Molum. And yet she was the secretary of state um, and I do feel you don't hear about her because she's a woman. She was the Secretary of State that got all those political parties in Northern Ireland round the table to agree the Good Friday Agreement. And they just wouldn't talk to each other for years. And she got them in a room. There was huge, huge discussions. There was huge disagreements. And she virtually locked them in the room for weeks on end till they actually agreed to that agreement. And yet she's wiped from history. And I just, uh, it's a really, just look her up. Um, she was an inspirational woman. She had a brain tumour at the time. So she had this wig on um, and she had lost all her hair. She put on loads of weight. She obviously didn't feel great, but she was determined to get that Good Friday Agreement signed. And there was one incident where Sinn Féin wouldn't talk to the DUP and she literally took her wig off and threw it across the table. Um, they were all men to shock them into, um, you know, you know, knocking their heads together. Um, she's one of the most underrated women in history. So I'd really encourage you to look her up and, um, you know, see what an inspirational woman she was. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us today. Next, we would like to move on to Millie McQuillan, who is a bold girl and deep mind scholar at Cambridge University.
Okay, this is a good advert for computer science. I'm just figuring out how you use Zoom. Cool, can everyone see my slides and everything? I'm gonna assume so, someone shout at me if you can't. Right, so um, good evening everyone and thank you for taking the time to listen to me speak this evening. Um, I do know from a year and a half of online university that I jump for joy during webinars because you're not on camera so you don't actually have to listen, but I am hoping to grab just 15 minutes of your time to convince you why you should consider studying computer science or taking a career in technology. Uh, which is not necessarily the same thing. We'll come on to that in a little bit. So moving my slides again, this is challenging stuff. Right, um, so a bit about me. I studied at Burgess Hill, um, not that many years ago, but yes, we had a different uniform. The school had a different name and different logo, um, but it was during my time at Burgess Hill that I decided to pursue a career in technology, uh, which wasn't necessarily for the reasons that most people do. So the reasons most people pursue a, a career in technology are, well, increasingly the salary, um, which I can't deny is getting much higher now than most other graduate roles. So if you like money, go for technology. And it seems that some people like money. Uh, wasn't my reason, though. Another reason was uh, reason people do it is because they're worried that a robot will take their job. And their logic is if they learn to program robots, then they, you know, they can program them to take other people's jobs, which, strictly speaking, is true. Um, but Again, not the reason that I went into technology. And kind of one final reason is the culture. Um, tech is a diverse and vibrant community of people, all driven by a single ambition to make the world a better place. And I have to say, it's an incredible thing to experience. In tech companies, you won't see people walking around in suits. Um, people are encouraged to wear what they're comfortable in and the office is made as fun as possible to spark creativity, communication and engagement between people and just make people happy. Um, so I'll admit that this part of it was incredibly tempting, but it didn't quite seal the deal. This was the reason that I decided that tech was for me. Um, I saw that companies like Google don't just allow dogs in the office. They go to the effort of badging them like full time employees. So at this moment, I decided that I would a try and get into computer science, get a job as a software engineer or b failing that I would find whatever certification I needed to become the person who badges the dogs at Google. So these were these are my two goals. I set about on the computer science route first because I think it was going to be better paid than making badges for dogs. Um, and I started that by doing a degree in computer science. Um, before I went to Durham, I hadn't done a great deal of programming before. In fact, many of you, what you cover now before year nine computer science will be far more rigorous than what I'd been exposed to before starting my degree um, because programming is now taught a lot better in schools. Um, and then I also pursued some internships because internships help you get jobs. So um, the first internship I did was at Morgan Stanley, which is a bank based in London. Uh, this is my first experience of industry technology. And while it was very cool and we got discounted tickets to Legoland, um, I was one too many suits for me and no dogs in the office. So Morgan Stanley was a no. So then I had to find other ways to beef up my CV so that I would get better jobs or jobs with more dogs, not necessarily better jobs, but you know, uh, you get what I'm pursuing here. So uh, hackathons are a great thing that you can do in technology. And what I love about hackathons is the diversity of people there. Um, so this was my team down on the right here. And we actually won this hackathon. I studied computer science. That's me on the far left. The girl next to me, graphic design. The girl next to her, art. The girl next to her, engineering. The girl next to her, tech policy. And the girl next to her studied philosophy. So as you can kind of see from this, you don't necessarily have to do computer science to understand or be able to build things with technology. And at this particular hackathon, we spent 24 hours, you don't usually sleep at these things, um, creating game, pumped up on Coke, the drink, um, and essentially you build something. In our case, it was a game to inspire people to care more about the environment. Uh, so that was a video game. Um, I also was fortunate enough to be selected as a Google Women Tech Maker Scholar, which meant I got to visit the office and yes, pet the dogs um, and the sniffer dogs which was hugely exciting um, and was also exposed to some more incredibly brilliant women in computer science. Um, if you haven't noticed, there's a theme here. Um, women do computer science. Lots of women do computer science. Um, it is not just for the boys. Um, and it's certainly something that I believe passionately that anyone can do. So then I started my second internship. This time it was at Amazon, specifically a subsidiary of Amazon called Amazon Robotics. So these are the robots that do things in the warehouses. Um, Unfortunately, in this particular internship, it was online, but it did mean that I got my dog in the office um, as it was. Um, and in this uh, internship, I was able to um, 
uh, essentially create a system for Amazon to help them calculate what was in the warehouses by looking at images. So they take a picture of a shelf essentially in their warehouse and then you'd use computer vision to say how much, how many items were on that shelf essentially because their current system was was fairly inaccurate doing that. So we got to um, help improve their systems by, by doing some research on that. I then decided to study postgrad computer science. So that's where I am now. I'm at Cambridge. I've just finished my master's here. Um, and long story short, my thesis revolved around uh, creating robots to take people's jobs. Um, longer than that, I was trying to program robots to be more social. So in this case, uh, in the middle here, you can see someone experiencing my experiment, which was trying to get the robot to be a waiter. Uh, which I think people quite enjoyed experiencing because uh, in February this year there wasn't much opportunity for you to be waited on in any other circumstance so um, people were jumping at the opportunity to be uh, in a fake restaurant environment. So what's next for me in terms of career path? So um, the most excited I think I've ever been about computer scientists, computer science sorry, was when I visited Google X in California and I took a 40 minute ride in a self-driving car which is one like the one on the right here um, and only then did I realize actually how serious technology is. Um, I don't know how many people in the audience drive or are learning to drive, um, but while before I did doubt whether computer, you know, self-driving cars could truly outperform humans, it wasn't until I sat in one and was aware that a car or a computer is able to account for every vehicle, 12 vehicles in front, 12 vehicles behind. Now it's probably a lot more than that because this was in 2018. Um, every single pedestrian, every lamppost, every sign, and me as a human driver, I'm not incompetent, but I can only focus on one or two things at once, especially when you're driving. So um, that was a really eye-opening experience for me to see just how powerful this technology has become. Um, so I became a very keen bean um, and started my own research on self-driving car technology. Um, and from that, I'll be joining uh, that was a video, but it's not a video, I guess. Um, a self-driving car startup after my second summer at Amazon. And I'm delighted to tell you that, yes, this company have several office dogs. Um, oh, there we go. That's how you go to the video. So this is an example here on the right of their self-driving car uh, driving around the streets of London. Um, so you still have to have safety drivers in the car. You still have to have someone sat behind the wheel with their hands ready to catch the wheel if the car does something wrong. Uh, but this is something that we're hoping kind of as cars get better, that regulations will change. And, and such as in America now, they do have fully autonomous cars driving around that will soon be able to have that in Europe and uh, in the UK. So now I'm going to talk a bit about what, where technology is at today. Um, so personally, I think the most exciting area of computer science currently is machine learning. Uh, machine learning is the idea that if you take huge amounts of data, say pictures of dogs or cats, and show these images to a computer, over time it becomes able to tell you what is a dog, what's a cat. Um, and while this alone doesn't seem impressive, um, AI has really expanded in the last few years. Um, so what you're about to watch here, um, and someone will need to shout at me if you don't get the audio for this, but you should do, um, is a trailer for a Netflix movie uh, called AlphaGo. Now, while we were all too young to remember the first chess player being defeated by an AI, uh, Go has always outsmarted artificial intelligence. This is because it involves a level of creativity that isn't really seen in chess um, and has many, many more possible moves. So a team at DeepMind decided to tackle this problem. Um, and this is the result.
So yeah, I don't know if you could hear that. I hope you could. But if you didn't, essentially AlphaGo beat the world champion at Go and you can watch the whole movie on Netflix. Um, I really recommend it. Um, it's terrifying, but fascinating in equal measure. And while we may think that AlphaGo was impressive and absolutely in 2016, it was, uh, DeepMind have extended it to something called AlphaGo Zero, which is a program not given any information by humans. Instead, it learns by playing itself. This program in 24 hours um, beat AlphaGo a program so powerful it got a Netflix movie, um, 100 games to zero. So technology and AI is becoming increasingly more intelligent. Um, I now wanna to just touch on a couple of the pitfalls, I think, because there's, there's pitfalls in everything you do. And the first is rejections. Um, like any industry with dogs in the office, uh, you'll find yourself on the end of more than one rejection. Uh, this is true in any career, to be honest. Uh, and this is personally something I've dealt with a lot, um, perhaps because I don't, approach computer science in a stereotypical way. The first time I applied to Amazon, I was rejected. The first time I applied for the Women Tech Maker Scholarship, I was also rejected. Um, in fact, I had planned to fill this slide with dozens upon dozens of email rejections, but I delete them all because I'm a sore loser and I don't need that negativity in my life. Um, this is how I've learned to handle rejections. Apply for something else immediately. Stop what you're doing and just apply. Uh, open a new opportunity in the face of a lost one and you'll find yourself in this endless cycle of applying and then yeah maybe being rejected but there's always an opportunity blooming and then another issue that is talked about a lot in tech is imposter syndrome uh, the work you do is so exciting and often groundbreaking that you can't believe you're actually good enough to contribute I'm not sure I understand. siri doesn't understand that um there is no solution to it everyone feels imposter syndrome and frankly people that don't aren't the kind of people you want to work with uh, my remedy for imposter syndrome is quite simple. It's a thought experiment. Let's assume for a moment that I have genuinely ended up in a room I don't deserve to be in and that I am actually an imposter. This doesn't happen, by the way. Application processes are long and boring for a reason. Um, but let's say I'm surrounded by people better, more interesting, more intelligent and more capable than me am, than, than I am. My advice is what a room to be in. It doesn't matter if you deserve to be there. Aim to spend every day full of people infinitely better, every day in rooms full of people infinitely better than you. Um, that's an incredibly lucky place to be and it is the single best way to grow as a person. So when you feel imposter syndrome, don't think, ah, I don't deserve to be here. Think, maybe I don't deserve to be here, but then I'm lucky that I am here. So, and make the most of that opportunity. Um, so I guess now you're probably thinking, oh, tech's quite cool, but um, I don't, you know, I don't want to wear a suit, uh, but I've taken humanities A-levels and I'm not studying computer science and I hate Microsoft Word. So um, here's the news I have for you. There are so many ways to get into tech. And firstly, you don't have to learn how to code. So my suggestions to get you started are number one, if you're going to university at any point, uh, consider taking it as an optional module in first year. Many courses have a learn to programming course uh, that you can take as an optional module in your first year or in later years. Take a learn to programming module if you can. Trust me, your CV and your future job applications will thank you for it. Um, secondly, uh, consider attending hackathons or code clubs. Um, these are usually for people who don't know how to code. Um, and it's not even necessarily about learning to code. It's just about engaging with technology, engaging with the industry and coming up with cool ideas to make the world a better place. And finally, if you really hate all of the idea of all of this, just consider doing what you're doing, but in a tech company whether you're a lawyer, whether you're an ethicist, philosopher, writer, artist, designer, creative thinker, policy maker, there is a space in a tech company for you and your dog who will get their own badge. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you very much for listening. And I guess I'll take questions at this point. Thank you so much, Millie. That was a really interesting speech and those Google dogs were very cute. <laughs> um, you actually answered quite a lot of our questions during your speech, but uh, we do have one that um, someone has ans uh, asked. So what advice do you have for anyone wishing to pursue a similar career path? I guess in tech, it's chase doing something cool and making the world a better place and that sounds really cheesy but that is about that's what makes you succeed in technology um, most of the jobs i've succeeded in are not necessarily the interviews where i've answered the questions correctly they're jobs i've gone into and i have been so passionate about the problem they're solving and what they're doing and that's all they're looking for is people who are super excited to solve these kind of problems um, it's all about creative thinking it's all about wanting to change the world and that's what's quite exciting on a more practical note 
you don't have to study computer science. You can study anything you want and then take, you know, learn to programming modules uh, or intro to programming modules, things like that. Uh, that's how you can kind of transition. And, and many, many of the people I work with did not study computer science. They, I, I would say, oh, they studied this. They, they didn't study. I couldn't pinpoint what they studied. Um, they come from all kinds of backgrounds and just did programming courses or hackathons to, to build their skills. So. Perfect. That's really helpful. Um, and thank you so much again for your time. Um, finally, I would like to introduce Lisa Sullivan, a former barrister and now Master of the Queen's Bench Division. Hello, and thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, I want to start off by explaining to you what I do. Um, Millie has quite a cool job, I have quite a cool job title. I think. I am a Master of the Queen's Bench Division of the High Court, um, and that uh, means that I'm a judge, and I hear cases um, in the Queen's Bench Division of the High Court. So I don't hear any criminal cases. Um, I frequently, if I meet people who don't know me and ask, they ask me what I do and I say I'm a judge, they say, oh, please don't send me to prison, um, but I don't send anybody to prison. Um, I deal with high value and complex uh, litigation um, where it's a civil dispute between people. So either where people have been injured, either in a road traffic accident or an accident at work or in a medical uh, negligence context where they've suffered a really serious life-changing injury or contract disputes between individuals or companies. Um, I deal with cases in defamation. That's where somebody has published something about somebody else um, that they say is untrue and has harmed their reputation or misuse of private information and data protection claims where people have, again, uh, normally published or used in some way private information about somebody else, which is said to be confidential and uh, damages are being sought. Um, and I also deal with some property claims and with uh, enforcements of judgments. So when a decision has been made by a court um, and um, a judgment for a sum of money has been made, but the person hasn't paid up um, or the company hasn't paid up, then I deal with applications to enforce that and get the money out of them. Or indeed, on the other hand, people saying, please don't make them enforce it against me. I haven't got the money. And there are also some uh, more niche and smaller aspects of it. So um, I, uh, earlier this month, um, had to... Uh, make decisions about some election petitions. Um, in these particular cases, they were about um, local authority, uh, local council elections and parish elections, but um, in other times it's general elections. Um, and I also have to um, make decisions about whether or not people should be, children should be allowed to change their name by deed poll. Um, I do hear some trials, but most of what I do um, is making decisions on how cases should be allowed to progress, whether they should be allowed to be brought at all, whether they're so hopeless that people shouldn't um, have to deal with it, what evidence um, should be allowed to be called um, and when, it should, when steps in litigation should be done. Um, I also um, have quite a big role in approving settlements where um, one of the litigants is either a child or somebody who doesn't have the um, mental capacity to make the decision from, for themselves. I have to um, look over all the papers and decide whether or not um, the, uh, the, the settlement is an appropriate one. Um, and I often have quite a number of cases in one day, so they're, they're relatively short hearings. It's, it's not that often that I have a case that will last um, for a number of days. And when I'm in court, people have to call me master, which is quite nice. Um, but I wanted to um, speak to you a bit about my path to becoming a, a judge. Um, I've listened, not, not to all of the, the speakers before me, but to a number of them, and they sound so impressive. They know so much, they've done such amazing things. And um, uh, Millie was talking about imposter syndrome. I think I could never do anything like that. And what they've done seems to me so much more impressive than what I've done. Um, I hope perhaps that some of them might think that what I do is quite impressive. Um, but I was like um, some of you listening at your age, I'm just a normal person. 
Uh, my mum was a teacher. My dad was a navigator in the RAF. I lived with my mum and my older sister and went to my local comprehensive. Um, when I was about 14, I decided I want to be a barrister. I, I never really quite worked out why. Um, I think probably because I was quite argumentative. And um, so the adults around me told me I should be a lawyer. Um, but I didn't know any lawyers. I didn't really know anything about the law at all. Um, but I went to study law um, and then went on to do um, train to be a barrister. The first year is a year's vocational course. Um, and then you have a year of what's called pupillage, which is a bit like a, a, a year long internship or apprenticeship, the second half of which you have your own cases. And when I started out, I wanted to do public law, so challenging government decisions and trying to make my mark on the world in that way. But where I did my pupillage, um, they did do uh, public law, but they also did a lot of um, clinical negligence and other injury law. And it turns out I really loved that. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be dealing with cases involving clinical negligence. Um, at the end of that year, I applied for what's called tenancy. And that, that's what you have to get in order to be a full-time barrister. You have to get a permanent place in chambers, which are the organisations that most barristers work from. Um, and I didn't get it. Um, and so I had to find another six month pupillage somewhere else and try again. And once I did that, I did get uh, my tenancy, but it was at a place that did all sorts of work that I really had never wanted to do. Um, so I did do crime, uh, which I'd never wanted to do. I did landlord and tenant housing disputes. Um, I did insolvency cases. Um, I did all sorts of work um, and I stuck at it. And then I later was able to move into the sort of work I wanted to do. And I moved to be a specialist in clinical negligence law. And I, so I was a barrister for about 22 years um, in, in all um, by the end of it. And uh, certainly by the end, I was mainly representing people who had been very seriously injured through medical negligence or through, um, through road traffic accidents. And in the meantime, through those 20 odd years, um, I had four children and for the last number of years as a barrister, um, having had my children, I realised that I really couldn't do it all. I couldn't work the six, six and a half uh, day week that I'd worked when I was younger and be a, a, a mother actually paying attention to her children. Um, I stopped working at weekends and went down to a four day week. Um, I say that it was unless I really had to do the work, then sometimes you just have to do it. Um, and in 2019, I applied to be a judge. Um, and there's an interview process for that. And like one of the earlier speakers, in the end, you get appointed by the Queen. But the chances of the Queen uh, knowing me if she passed me on the street is pretty slim. Um, but I also sit as a judge four days a week. So even though I was doing less work um, and working four days a week, um, they knew that when I applied and, and I said I wanted to continue to do that and they're perfectly happy for me to do it four days a week. Um, and my day off, uh, which is a Friday, I do the laundry and I pay the bills and I organise um, all the trips for my children and what's going on with them. It's, it's not particularly glamorous, um, but it does mean I can do all of that. So as I said earlier, um, listening to some of the other speakers, um, to me, what I do seems so much less impressive than what they do. Um, and I think this is part of um, the imposter syndrome and the lack of confidence that some of the other speakers um, have spoken about. Um, and I think, well, they, they're so much more impressive than me. How, how is that? When I was a, a, more, a junior barrister, um, I would see these women um, who were much more senior than me, who were doing these amazing, important cases um, they had children, they were on top of their games, they always seemed to be on top of everything um, in their family life as well. And um, there was one colleague in particular who I, I thought was just amazing. I could never, ever be like her. That was until I had my first um, child and she started to talk to me a bit more about um, her home life and how, um, there's one story about how her eldest daughter was really upset with her. Um, and she had created some horrid concoction, a bit like, I think a bit like um, in uh, uh, George's Marvelous Medicine, and sneaked up to her mum's room, had taken the duvet off and put the horrible concoction in the bed and then uh, put the duvet down and made it so her mum wouldn't know about it until she got into bed as some sort of punishment. Uh, in fact, her daughter felt so guilty about it that she told her mum before she got into bed. 
But then I realised that that this colleague who I so looked up to, who appeared to me to have everything in hand, didn't necessarily have everything in hand. And yet she was still doing these amazing cases and appearing to be amazing. So um, I think I've learned through that and through my own experience that I can't be perfect at everything or probably anything. Um, I still remember the embarrassment of taking my kids to school one morning and realizing that not only had I not put their hair up as the school rules required, but they hadn't even brushed it. And um, it, was, it, was, it was proper bedhead hair. Um, and you know, that's uh, obviously not something a mother should be doing, but there you go. Equally, turns out being a mother gives you some really good skills for being a judge. So mediating between my four children when they're arguing um, has given me the patience and tact required that stands me in great stead for when I have lawyers who are bickering in front of me as a judge. Um, I have to explain sometimes complex issues to my children um, in simple terms. And I don't always have lawyers in front of me as a judge. Sometimes they are, there are non-lawyers and they're dealing with difficult and complex areas of the law. And I have to be able to explain those areas to them and my decisions to them in a, a, a simple way that they will understand, even though it's a, a complex area. Um, so my uh, message to you um, is really that if you have the ambition and you want to do something, then um, you should go ahead and do it. Don't worry that you're not as good as um, the other people who you see ahead of you or you've seen doing it, because you probably are. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for that. That was a very interesting talk from you. Uh, we have a couple of questions we'd love you to answer. Our first one is, what is the impact of AI on the law and judicial system? And do you think courtrooms will look different in the years to come? Well, so over the last uh, year and a bit, um, I've been doing my hearings remotely, um, using, not using Zoom, we use Teams. Um, but, uh, but so we've been doing a bit more technology. Um, I don't think that the experience tells us that AI will have a huge impact um, in, in the near future. Um, in part uh, because the technology that the courts have is um, uh, not necessarily the most up to date, um, but also because what I think we've all learned in, although remote hearings are good for some um, less complex issues, um, we really miss out on that personal interaction and making eye contact and, and the soft skills of reading people in the room. So I think that um, the idea that um, uh, uh, judges will be replaced by robots making decisions on cases applying the case law, I suspect is, is, is somewhere off. Thank you. Um, the next question we have is, what advice do you have for someone interested in following a similar career path to you? Um, so, uh, you have to um, want to do it because it is a, the sort of job, I suppose, like a, a number of the jobs you've heard about, where you do have to commit a lot of time and effort into it. You don't have to do any particular degree. I did a law degree, but lots of barristers and judges did history or politics or all sorts of things. There's a, a, one of my uh, colleagues as a barrister was an ex-nurse, um, so that's another one for going into nursing, first of all. Um, but I think you need to be able to communicate well, um, you need to be able to analyse and um, you need to be able to um, be uh, dispassionate about things and make sure that the emotion of some of the cases doesn't get too much because they can be um, very upsetting. So uh, it, it, it's work hard, uh, do what you're good at at studies because anything can take you into law. Thank you. Uh, our final question for you tonight is um, the, the job role of a barrister can be um, seen stereotypically as quite a male dominated field. So how has it been for you being a female in, uh, in law? The field I worked in in clinical negligence is, is one of those where actually there are more women um, 
than in some other cases. I'm not going to say there are more women than men because there, there aren't. And it is um, very much still um, a male dominated field. Um, but equally, I've just got on and done the job. And I'm sure I know there have been cases where I wasn't asked to be a barrister because I was female. But I imagine there may have been other cases where the client has felt happier with a, a, a female barrister and more able to talk about their, their personal, uh, particularly intimate medical details. Um, so the there are issues because when I started out uh, 20 whatever years ago, there were the same number of uh, female as male barristers qualifying. And if you go up through um, the more senior people now, there are still many fewer women barristers at the senior levels than men. So that 50-50 split hasn't carried through. Um, and I think part of that is the difficulty of um, childcare um, with managing that with the job as a barrister. But I'm hopeful um, that it will get better and that the more um, female judges we see, the more we see that it's, it's, it's a job that women can do and can succeed in and do succeed in. And the more that happens, that perhaps um, the, the, those 50-50 at the bottom will, will keep working its way through. Thank you very much for joining us um, this evening. Uh, it's been very insightful uh, to, from, to hear from you. Um, I'm sure we can all agree that, that was a phenomenal lineup of speakers, and we can all draw inspiration from their wide ranging achievements. On behalf of myself and the Lowest students, our sincerest thanks go to all of today's speakers. You are a great example to the women of tomorrow. Our thanks also to all of the external schools who have attended tonight, as well as the pupils of Bright Hill Girls. I am delighted you were able to join us. When I joined Bowers Hill Girls Prep School as a 10-year-old, I had just read Malala Yousaf's autobiography. I'd like to end this evening with one of her quotes. There are two powers in this world. One is the sword and the other is the pen. There is a third power stronger than both, that of women. Thank you and good night.